everyone. It's so good to see so many faces. And welcome to the Hillsboro Literacy Council Annual Student Tutor Assembly. My name is Brandi Meredith, and I'm the president of the board of the Hillsboro Literacy Council. And on behalf of the board, I just want to welcome you today. Because for us, this is one of the best days of the year because we get to celebrate the achievements, the time, and dedication of our tutors and students. The Hillsboro Literacy Council, affectionately known as HLC, provides free confidential literacy help to adult learners. We administer several programs to our basic literacy program and our English for speakers of other languages, or ESOL program. The basic literacy program provides one-on-one -on -one tutoring for adults who wish to learn to read up to the fifth grade level, while our ESOL program offers small group tutoring for adults who like to learn English. Our conversation corner, our informal ESOL drop-in program for those who want to practice their speaking English. And so thanks to the efforts of library staff, volunteers and tutors, board members, we've been able to provide these services for over 30 years. And we've continued to grow and evolve while remaining true to what makes HLC so very special. And that's the individual connections that bring learning through our tutors and students. During the pandemic, we expanded our services to provide online tutoring, and today we're excited to share the next step in our journey to the online environment. Before we begin today's program, I want to thank the director of the Hillsborough Literacy Council Public Library Cooperative, Andrew Bradenwall, for being with us today, and our MC, Lisa Clark, who some of you may not know yet, but she's a literacy coordinator at, H at the library and will serve as today's MC. And finally, I want to give a very special thank you to Dr. Fox, whose career and long-standing service to the Tampa community shows what education and community service can do to transform lives. Thank you all for being present here today and for your contributions to Hillsborough Literacy Council. Please enjoy the assembly. This has been a really remarkable uh, comeback from the pandemic times and getting, getting folks back in the door and back uh, on their tutoring rounds. So it's really wonderful to have you all here gathered up again today. Um, as Brandy mentioned, I am the, the newest literacy coordinator for the library, so I'm really getting to know a lot of you. Uh, you're most, you've been mostly working with my colleague Giselle, who is a rock star. Uh, we will keep that service going uh, throughout. But I want to take a moment now. A lot of the ceremonies focus on the, the transaction of the volunteers uh, giving their time and their energy and, and that uh, love of learning and sharing that with their students and the learners uh, gaining this valuable service and having that uplift their lives and enrich their lives. And I just want to take a moment to acknowledge how much it does for the community as a whole. Because it's not just the one individual receiving that benefit of these literacy skills. It's not just the one volunteer that is uh, being fulfilled by providing the service. It's every single person in the community who sees the volunteer dedicating that time. And it's every single person who sees that person putting in the incredibly hard work to build these skills for themselves and their families. So every single person that is a witness to that work on both sides is being enriched by this as well, and that is how we are building communities together. It can't be done without, without both parts of it. So I love this opportunity to have everyone together, the students and the teachers, and just really applaud of what a joy you're bringing to the community as a building block. So thank you all for coming here today. I am now going to introduce our library director, Mr. Andrew Bradenbaugh, who has a few words to say as well. We, we come to keep it short and uh, make sure that we're all good. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Um, I'm Andrew Bradenbaugh, director of the Tampa Hillsborough County Public Library. and. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be with you again to celebrate uh, your achievements this year. 
Um, every year that I come here and speak, it is so inspiring to read in the, the, the uh, booklet and to uh, hear you speak about your achievements and your journey to English proficiency. Uh, and so I, I started, I looked back and I started to look at some of the comments that I had made over previous years and I realized I had spent a lot of time talking about the utility of literacy, the practical side of it. Oh, it's good to get a job, it's great to be able to participate in civic life and to be more economically successful and trust me, I've thrown a lot of statistics at you over the years. Uh, and these things are super important. I don't want to put that on the sideline. They're super important, but there's an aspect of literacy that I really wanted to really pinpoint this year. And that was just reading and the ability to read for the sheer joy of it. Uh, we tend to put that on the sidelines lately in our, in our cultural dialogue, that we want such to show some practical nature. But just the ability to read just for the fun of it is absolutely uh, an overwhelming experience. And I just wanted to make sure that we highlighted that. Um, you know, being able to share stories and poems and our lives in speaking and in the written word, it's, it's fun, it's pleasant, but it also can be very, very powerful. Um, it's through this, uh, this joy that we find in, in reading and literacy that we also find our voices. And that is the core of it. Trust me, when you do this, all of the other stuff will come, and it's always more exciting and more fun to do something because you want to than because you're told you have to. And so uh, stick with it. This is a, a great journey you've gone on, so I want to congratulate you for that um, and all the hard work and, and remind you that don't forget that it's fun. It's not just practical, but it's fun as well. Uh, I also want to thank all the tutors. Uh, you guys give generously of your time. You do amazing work uh, making sure that uh, and helping our students find that voice that they can express. And, and I would be remiss, again, I didn't thank the Hillsborough Literacy Council. None of this would be happening if it weren't for their hard work and dedication and fundraising and everything they do. And uh, the library is always is a proud partner with the Hillsborough Literacy Council in making this happen. So thank you guys for coming and congratulations for all of your hard work. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to take a moment to uh, say hello to some of my colleagues, some of whom you've spoken to before, some of whom you're meeting for the first time. So first, I wanted to point out Giselle. She is over there by the door. Every single person in this room has probably had the joy of working with Giselle at some point or another, be it by phone or email or otherwise. We could not do this without all of the hard work she puts in every day to keep these programs going. So thank you, Giselle. Uh, I also want to point out that we have another uh, new face here. We have Mr. Jeffrey Huggins. He is right here in the front. And uh, our team recently transitioned to be a part of his team. So uh, literacy is definitely a huge part of community engagement and outreach. And uh, we could not be a better fit uh, than to join his team. So we're very excited to kind of expand the scope of what we can do just by that new uh, alliance there. So thank you, uh, Mr. Huggins. And at the same table, we have a familiar face to many of you, Eric Hughes. So Eric was the literacy coordinator before I uh, took this on, and he is now with the Literacy Council. So even though he changed teams, uh, we, we still like him. And I'm going to ask Eric to come on up here as he is going to introduce our uh, keynote speaker for today. So come on up, Eric. speaker, someone that I think you're going to be inspired by, someone you're going to learn from, and she's sitting right here in front, Dr. Liana Fox, Fernandez Fox, I guess I don't want to stick anything there, and let me tell you a little bit about her. Dr. Fox is a fourth generation 
from her Cuban and Sicilian ancestors living right here in Tampa, maybe even in this, this very area, right? Um, she began attending the University of South Florida in 1964 and received her PhD from there in 1998. She taught mathematics for almost 40 years at HCC and USF. She pioneered online mathematics courses for HCC and taught, this sounds really cool, a live call-in show for the Tampa Bay Education Channel. That's very cool, very cool. I wouldn't do it today, though. No? Okay. We won't make it. In uh, 2019, she was granted Professor Emeritus status in the first cohort ever awarded this uh, by the Hillsborough Community College. Uh, a few more things. In 2020, she was honored with a Lifetime Achievement Award by the League of Women Voters and received the Hometown Hero Award from the Tampa Bay Lightning. That's very cool. We've tried to get that a few times. <laughs> we can keep on trying. And now she's here with us, hopefully adding this experience to that long and uh, prestigious list of achievements that she's achieved. And I think you guys are going to be very excited to hear what she has to say. I know I am. So, Dr. Fox, would you please come up here? So, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm thrilled to see so many of you here. And I'm honored uh, to be invited to come and address you and to say, first of all, we appreciate you very much. Tutors, students, families that uh, lend support to the students who are learning English, thank you very much. Um, I'm a lifelong volunteer, so I know that um, organizations can't really put a price on what it is that you contribute, so thank you very much. I'd like to thank Jennifer, also my good longtime friend, for inviting me and telling me about the Literacy Council. Uh, and she thought maybe my story might be interesting to you. I started to prepare these notes three different times and with three different themes. You know, I, wanted, I thought I'd talk about maybe what AI might mean to those of us who are artificial intelligence, might mean to those of us who are struggling to learn a new language, to read and write it, and then here comes this technology that just with a clip does it for you. And I thought about a couple of other things, but I landed on back to what Jennifer suggested to me, and that was telling my story to you, because most of you are not native Tampeños, in other words, from Tampa. How many of you were born in Tampa? Would you raise your hand so I know? So see, just a handful. So um, maybe when I tell you my story, you'll get a sense of um, what Tampa has uh, accomplished and how far we've come. I'm going to say in the last 100 years. I'm not 100 years old, but almost. <laughs> but my family has been here um, over 100 years. They came in the early 1900s. So um, as uh, Eric said, um, I am the fourth generation of my family living in Tampa. My sons would be the fifth, but they didn't get the memo, they don't live here. <laughs> so I have one uh, living in Palm Beach with his family and the other living in San Francisco. So you know what I spend a lot of time doing, going back and forth. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, start by telling you, I want you, I'm giving you an assignment while I'm speaking, okay? So I want you to look for three themes as I talk to you about what's happened to me over my life. Uh, the first is education, the importance of education and what it has meant to me and my family. The second is language and beyond language also terminology and context that you understand uh, the context, the environment in which you're learning these words. And then the third one is mentoring and connecting to people. And that's something, it kind of came natural to me, and I guess because my parents exhibited it all the time. We always had connections to our family, to our neighbors, to clubs and uh, nonprofit organizations, and we continue to give back. So look for those three themes as I talk to you and see if you, you get it. So yes, um, we uh, started in Ybor City. Our families came here. My uh, great-grandmother 
came from Santo Stefano, Nikistina, Sicily, and she came with her 14-year-old sister, and she was 12, just the two of them, on the boat by themselves. They ran out of food on the boat, and after two days of not eating at towards the end, they found a corner or a, a end of a loaf of bread in the corner of the ship. So they grabbed that, they split it, and that's what they ate their last day that they were on that boat. Consequently, in my family's houses, nobody throws away hard bread. We keep it, we grate it into breadcrumbs, we bread our chicken, our fish, whatever. We don't throw away hard bread because we always remember her story. She had 11 children. The 11th was um, in her womb when her husband died in 1918 of the Spanish flu, they call it. So it was the first pandemic, right? And so the 11, I said to my grandmother once, Nana, how did you manage? Because, you know, I knew she couldn't, my great-grandmother couldn't work with 11 children. And she said, you know how we manage? We each raise each other. So once the oldest ones were old enough to go to work, most of them didn't finish school. They started going to work to bring money home to help raise the rest of them. Uh, uh, one of the photos in the restaurant in Ybor City of Casa Santo Stefano of um, Richard Gonsmart has a photograph of my great-grandmother and my grandmother and nine of her brothers and sisters and their wives. And I recently got to show my granddaughter that picture. And I said, this is my great-grandmother, this is my grandmother, these are the, et cetera, et cetera. And so she went back to the table and she told my son, that's my double great and my triple great grandmother. <laughs> so, uh, such a proud moment for me. Um, there were three languages spoken in my family, uh, Spanish, Italian, and English. However, my parents, when they went to school, were uh, castigated for speaking Spanish or Italian in school. The teachers punished them, gave them, uh, you know, extra homework, etc. when they caught them speaking those languages. So consequently, in our home, they said, that's not going to happen to our children, we will speak only English. So it was difficult for me to learn uh, Spanish or Italian, but thank God for grandmothers. Both of them, the Sicilian and the Cuban, refused to speak to me in English. The Cuban grandmother couldn't speak English, but the Sicilian grandmother could speak English very well. She went to the sixth grade. She's the only one in her family that got that far. And so, but she constantly referred to everything to me in Italian, and most of the times I answered her in English, but that was fine. I heard it. So, I do speak three languages, but as far as writing, hmm, that's very difficult for me. I can read them both perfectly, but writing is very difficult. So identify with you when you're learning to write English. Um, I, I have very loving teachers. I ended up at a Catholic girls' high school, and uh, there was 26 in my senior class. And we, we went there for 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th. No emphasis on going to college. They were just happy that we were completing our high school diploma. The nuns were the Sisters of the Holy Name. And there was a rich Holy Name school on Bayshore. And we're the poor Holy Name school on 3515 Florida Avenue. So it's a red brick school. It's still standing. It's got a black arch. And I don't know what they're doing with the grounds right now. It's a big controversy. But anyway, the school is still standing. But they closed in 1976 to the high school. But it was a very close-knit small, loving community. Two of the girls in my class did not speak English very well. The nuns helped them tremendously. Uh, because we were only 26, we did not have advanced math courses. Everybody took the same math course. I loved mathematics. The nun, Sister Marie Celeste, recognized that. And she kept giving me books on the side. We never had a trigonometry course. She gave me the trigonometry book so that I could teach myself. So it was a little bit of a struggle, but when we graduated, I wanted to go to St. Mary's Dominican in New Orleans, Louisiana. It was a Catholic university. 
My father, the human, said, Are you crazy? New Orleans? You, my daughter, is not going to New Orleans to go to school. That city is not for young, women, young ladies. I, I was so devastated. So I really lost my enthusiasm, you know. Well, at that moment is when USF first opened. And I'm telling you a, a line that I say in every speech that I give. If it was not for the time and the place that the University of South Florida built that campus, there are generations now, three generations after that, of Latin women that would not have gotten a university college education because our parents, number one, couldn't afford to send us. Number two, we're not going to let the daughters go. My brothers, oh yeah, University of Florida, both of them. Immediately, as soon as they said, I want to go to Gainesville, okay, there you go. But I was the oldest and the only girl. No, I was not leaving Tampa. So I thank God for Sam Gibbons and all the John Germany that you know from the library. Uh, all the, and they were all men apparently at that time that came up with the idea to build that university there. I happened to be president of the Alumni Association the day we turned the shovel for the Alumni Association building on the USF campus. So there I am next to Sam Gibbons turning the shovel and he signed the hard hat for me. It's one of my most prized possessions because I thanked him very much for all the work that they did to put the university there. But when I got to USF again, remember I told you I didn't have formal mathematics training at Sacred Heart Academy. My first pre-calculus course, remember I did not have trig, I had no idea what they were talking about. This comes back to language and vocabulary. I spoke English. They were not speaking English. They were speaking Greek. Sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent. I, you know, I had no idea. So I was struggling. I barely barely passed that class. And the professor saw me in the parking lot at the end of the semester and said to me, Ms. Fernandez, I believe you have nothing to contribute to the field of mathematics. I recommend that you find another major. Oh, did I start crying? And I cry a lot. Did I start crying? No. I put my foot down and turned, and I immediately went to the, what we call then the UC, University Center, where all my friends were, and of course they were mostly Latin girls, Italian and Spanish girls from Tampa. And I told them what happened to me. And they said, well, you're not gonna take that, you're not gonna accept that, are you? I said, absolutely not. They said, okay, what about education? What about teaching mathematics? I said, well, there's an, I hadn't thought about that. But I said, I think I can do that. And I walked over to the College of Education and. The rest is history. I started in uh, the College of Education in 1966, and I never left it until <laughs> 1998. And now I'm serving on their advisory council, mentoring students, and I feel like I owe my life uh, to that institution, and I continue. I don't like to use the word give back. Do you hear that a lot? People are giving back. I feel like I'm, I continue to make contributions to them, because I don't think anything was given to us. We really worked hard to get it. So I don't feel like I'm giving back. I feel like I'm making a contribution and supporting. And so I volunteer my time. I volunteer my expertise. I write a few checks. I do everything I can to support the College of Education. And I'm here to tell you it's alive and well. Don't believe any of those headlines. They closed it temporarily, but they didn't know who they were doing, dealing with when they did that. So. We took care of that pretty quickly. And it's back open, recruiting students, and I'm there to encourage them and support them. I transferred my senior year to FSU because I got engaged to my wonderful husband of close to 55 years now, Bob. Um, he was at FSU, and I went up there to be with him, so my bachelor's is from there. Um, our, in the transition from USF to FSU, I lost credits, and so it put me backwards. Uh, on my graduation date. I had to, we were on quarter system at the time. It was 1968, no, 1969. So I had to catch up. The last class I had to take was called 
modern algebra. Talk about language. I had never heard those vocabulary words before. A kernel, K-E-R-N-E-L, that's what you eat on corn, right? Kernels of corn, that's all I knew. Oh no, it's a mathematics um, function and it has a huge definition. You had to learn how to apply it, etc. Whole list of new vocabularies and there I am again. I spoke perfect English but I didn't understand what they were talking about. It was a very small book. It was only about this thick. We desperately needed me to graduate because my husband was still in college. If I didn't pass that course, I wasn't going to graduate and go to work. I had to pass that course. We only had two tests, the midterm and the final. In the midterm, I made a D, like a dog. <laughs> I was devastated. I didn't know how to tell my husband. He said, well, you just got to ace that final. I said, ace the final? I'm at a D right now. Anyway, that little book, I memorized it. I didn't have any idea what any of it meant in the real world, <laughs> but I memorized it. There were sheets of yellow legal pad all over my, our apartment because as I memorized it, I would write it and write it. Because in those days, you got blue books and you had to write all the answers to the questions in blue books. So the final exam came, I went, my stomach was in a knot, I wrote everything that I could, I left the exam, my husband said, well, well. I said, I have no idea. I wrote everything, I was the last one out of there, I wrote everything I knew, everything I remembered. I hope I answered correctly. So, I go back two days, and they post, that was in the days where they used to post the grades on the way. Everything was old, you could have old, so old fashioned. So they would post the grades on the door, no paper. Next day, no paper. The third day, finally, he says, well, you're going to have to contact him and find out. I said, I don't know how to do that. In those days, it was very difficult. You didn't find him in person. So I went again, and he was there. I said, excuse me, Dr. Kelly, but um, I wondered how I did on the exam. It's very important to me and my husband. He says, oh, there are the grades right there on the table. So I went and looked at the paper, and I looked at the grades first, and I went, dog, God, somebody made 100% on this exam. Oh my God, it was me. <laughs> I said, um, I'm so excited, I'm so grateful, thank you, that means I'll get a C in the class, right? Because I got a D and an A, and oh, might it be a B? He says, oh no ma'am, anyone that makes 100 on one of my exams gets an A in this class. <laughs> so I got the A, it was just fabulous. My husband from that point on, he says, I'm never going to believe you again when you tell me you're failing a class because I did not fail. I, I did very, very well. Fast forward, I'm taking too long, let me go faster. Um, so from there, um, we started our careers and then I started my first job as, as a statistician because in March, there are no teaching jobs. I was a statistician for the State Road Department because I had one computer course and one logic course. That qualified me. The computer language in those days was Fortran 4. I knew how to write programs Fortran 4, another language. Okay, you get my theme now as we're going through here? I spoke English the whole time, but I was constantly having to learn other languages, other vocabularies in order to progress in my life. So there I was, right out of college, 21, 22 years old, newly married, in the Department of Transportation. A six foot six man named Samuel Kilgore with a mustache that curled like somebody's I saw here today, <laughs> who was, yes, bigger than yours, very curly. Sam Kilgore, bless his heart, I'm sure he's passed away now. That man had the courage to hire me right out of college to be in charge of all these engineers who were designing the highways for the state of Florida at that time. So that didn't occur to me. I thought, you know, yeah, I'm qualified, I'll do this job, you know, but now looking back, how did that man know that I could do that? So um, this is what happened. They would bring all the counts 
You know how you cross the road? You see all those um, rope-like things? They're counting cars to see how many cars are going, uh, taking that road in particular. And then you combine those counts into what you're creating for the new highway to make sure they can carry that load. Apparently, they didn't do that so well at I-4 and I-275. <laughs> but that wasn't me. I was gone by then. <laughs> so uh, we had trays of punch cards. And so I would write the program out by hand. And then I would turn it in, and they would have the cards punched. And then I'd put them in these long, narrow trays. And then I would load the tray into my car and drive to FSU because there was one computer in the city of Tallahassee. It was in the basement of the basketball gym, Tully gym, freezing cold because they had to keep it cold for the computer. And I turn in my box of cards, they put them in the machine, and they come out with the program. And it tells me if I made a mistake or not, you know, et cetera. God forbid that you drop the tray because the order in which the cards went in is important. Anyway, so um, working back at Causeway, I don't know if any of you have been to Miami, but I only worked there one year. Working back at Causeway is when I helped with uh, the design and the counts, and we had to make a new highway to get to Key Biscayne because Richard Nixon was president, and that's where his winter home was. And the Secret Service needed to be able to get on and off Key Biscayne quickly. So we had to redesign that highway. So if you ever go to Miami and you see Rick and Baxter, you say, ah, Leanna Fox helped build that highway. I don't know what they do up there now, but it's certainly not the State Road Department that we knew. OK, let's get back to, um, I'm going to summarize here quickly. Um, there are four years I'm going to tell you about significant turning points in my life. Uh, in um, 1980, two significant things happened, and some very significant people entered my life. I was hired full-time at HCC. I had been teaching part-time until I got my master's degree, because you can't work there without a master's degree. And um, as soon as they hired me, they temporarily sent me to USF for 15 years uh, to teach. HCC math courses on the USF campus. Uh, and I lived in Temple Terrace, so I loved it. It was only 10 minutes from my house, and it became a wonderful place for me to grow professionally and personally. Um, I did finish my master's before I got there, but then I was encouraged by my mentors at HCC, Dr. Sandra Wilson, who's no longer with us, and Dr. Sylvia Carley, also, who is no longer with us, both of them had tributes to them occur in this Saunders Library um, a couple of years ago. They are the ones that kept writing me, Fox, Fox, Foxy, that's what they used to call me, Foxy. You gotta get your PhD, you gotta get your PhD. I said, I've got two kids, a full-time job, a husband, a wife, a, a, a mother and father that need care, but somehow, in six years, I did it. Halfway through, I wanted to quit. I started in 92. And do you know what my Sicilian mother said to me? Well, I said, Mom, it's going to take me six years. I won't finish till 1998. She said, well, how old will you be in 1998 if you don't do it? <laughs> <laughs> That is her Sicilian logic. That means the years are going to pass. You can do something to grow every single year of your life because the time is going to pass anyway. You're going to be that old anyway. And at the end of 1998, I had my PhD. So I finished that. Um, I also was honored by Tampa Hispanic Heritage for my volunteer work, and I was awarded Tampa Hispanic Woman of the Year. The reason I tell you that is that my father was in his assisted living by that time, and he died shortly after I received my PhD. I think he was waiting to see if I would finish. And when I went to help take his things out of the room, there was the Tampa Tribune article 
on the bulletin board of his room where they had my picture and the article about the Hispanic Woman of the Year. So he obviously was very, very proud. So that was an important year for me. In 2001, my mother, who had taken great care of my dad, needed a lift, and I took her to Sicily, where her ancestors came from. We had no idea until we got there. It was the 100th anniversary of my grandfather's birthday. So there we were on the anniversary where my grandfather would have turned 100 years old, and I have a picture of my mother holding the doorknob of the house where he grew up, 19 Chichito Street. I still have it. And the house where she grew up, by the way, is still standing, 2922 22nd Street. You know I like numbers, right? So I remember all these addresses. But if you go 22nd Street, it used to be the only house left on the block. They knocked all the rest of them down, but now they have a brand new one that's built there. So I guess uh, they're uh, gentrifying that area of 21st Avenue and 27th Street. Um, in, uh, that was in 2001. 2007 was a milestone because I spent three months in Florence, Italy. I went with USF's Travel Abroad by myself. I have to pick come. So I show up at the orientation in Florence, and all my friends who were professors at USF were there teaching the classes. Hey, I didn't know we were teaching algebra here this summer. I said, you're not. And they said, well, what are you doing here? I said, I'm a student. Well, they died laughing. I was obviously the oldest student in that class, but I just, I was turning 60 that year, and I wanted to go see Italy and see the roots, go to Sicily and see where my um, ancestors came from. It was an eye-opening experience. I encourage any of you that can, and it's very affordable now if you go through these student programs. They find you student housing. Your insurance is included. They have interpreters that they will love you, but you must take Italian. So. Uh, back when I told you I spoke three languages, I sort of lied to you. Because when I got there, in Florence, Italy, I realized I wasn't speaking Italian. I was speaking Sicilian that came to Tampa with my ancestors in 1900. That language did not change here. It stayed the same. Why? Because nobody knew came to change it, right? The ones that came here stayed, and they taught each of their generations. When I got to Italy, I realized the Sicilians no longer speak Sicilian, they speak Italian. So, I said, Io voglio gelato. No, I said, Io voglio mantecato, which is what we say here in Tampa. There, it's Io voglio. I, oh, I've never heard of that word in my life. In Tampa, when I say I, it's Io. Over there, it was ego, ego, volume. So, learning a whole new language. Yes, I thought I spoke Italian, but that Italian course I took in Italy really taught me how to speak Italian. So, I'll wind up with this story. I took so many pictures while I was there, you can imagine. My son escorted me over, so we went six, uh, that's far, four weeks early and uh, explored. And then at the end, and then he came back home, and I went to my classes. And then at the end, my husband came, because he was afraid I wasn't going to come home. <laughs> and he brought me back. So it was a whole three months. It was the most fabulous time of my life. On my own, learning a new language, because I thought I knew that language, but I didn't. And uh, experiencing things um, that I will never forget and are very, very close to me. In 2016, I am, am still a member of the board of the Tampa Bay History Center, and we went to Cuba. And we went in November, um, on, uh, we were supposed to leave on Tuesday, the Saturday before Castro died. So we didn't know if we were going to get to go or not. But we did go. The only difference was, sadly, there was no music, because the entire country was in mourning. But we did get to experience and see everything. I found a cousin that I didn't know I had, Eva Diaz. She's exactly my age. She's also a teacher, and she teaches English 
to uh, people from other countries that go to Cuba to study medicine. They have a fabulous uh, college of medicine there in Havana. So people come from Israel, from Germany, every place to study there, and she teaches Spanish to them. And I met Emma. The Tampa Tribune happened to be there because Castro had died, or Tampa Times, I should say. So they were filming all over the place. I don't know if you know Jeff Patterson, but he happened to be there. He found out we were there. Somebody told him I was connecting with my cousin. So he said, do you mind if we film you, your reunion? I said, I don't mind, but she's the one that's got to live here in a communist country after I leave. So you ask her. She was fine with it. So thanks to Jeff Patterson and Channel 8, I have a three and a half minute film of meeting my cousin for the first time in Havana, Cuba, and I had my granddaughter with me, and she was three years old then, and she got to meet her too. It is priceless. Travel whenever you can, whatever you can afford it. Um, student travel is very affordable, so look into it. I encourage it very much. Okay, so what am I doing now? I have three beautiful grandchildren, which I never thought I would have. I stay very involved with my university. I served on the Latin Community Advisory Council for 25 years. I'm done with that because they're done with me. They want young people. Uh, I help with the College of Arts and Sciences, Women in Leadership and Philanthropy, but most important to me is the College of Education at USF. I continue to support it all I can. So here's my conclusion. Education, language, and mentoring. That's what I started with. Remember the three themes? Okay. They have been prevailing themes all throughout my life. If I had been missing any one of those, my path might have been very different. Who knows? Education absolutely made a difference for my family. I told you my grandmother was the only one who went to school, my Sicilian grandmother, to the sixth grade. My brothers, I'm so proud of them. My brother Bob was the county administrator for four counties in the state of Florida. Alachua, Collier, Osceola, and Manatee. Uh, I'm very, very proud he ran those counties. My younger brother, the baby brother that we always tease, became an aerospace engineer. So we went in three generations from someone who had at the most, she of her siblings had a sixth grade education to those of us. My cousin, my first cousin, Mary Teresa Spoto, just retired with a PhD also. She was the Vice President of Academic Affairs at St. Leo University. Her brother, Angelo Spoto, is a Jungian psychologist. I had to look it up. I didn't know who Carl Jung was, but a Jungian psychologist very, he travels all over giving lectures. The, are you understanding my, my uh, emphasis on education and what a huge difference it made in my family? So um, here's my message to you all. I urge you, first, have confidence in yourselves. But don't hesitate to reach out to that mentor or supporter who wants you to be successful. Make sure you understand the context of the words that you're reading or hearing. Don't be afraid to ask. And lastly, most importantly, check your sources. We know that not everything we read or hear these days is entirely correct. Make sure you know where the source is from and that you trust that source. Check with other people who you trust. They'll let you know. Again, I congratulate you on taking the important step to becoming a good communicator that will lead to, a, to opening doors and experiences. It may come as something as simple as being able to read a recipe for a new dessert or learning how to double it or triple it or cut it in half. That's where your math is going to come in. Perhaps it will lead to a deeper involvement in your family's lives, communicating with second and third generations who only speak English and don't speak the language that you spoke as a child. Perhaps it will lead to a better understanding of government and the laws that affect you. We desperately need citizens who are good communicators, and we welcome your participation. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Fox. Uh, that was, uh, I, I love hearing it. Uh, I know many of us 
had similar experiences. Uh, I myself came to this country uh, as a young person. I was still a kid, uh, but uh, the experience is, is a unique one. It's a special one. I am going to draw your attention to the uh, publication that's on your tables. I'm sure you've been leaking through it. We have the Visions 2023 out right now. This is something that we produce every year for this event, and it is a collection of essays and poems and just short pieces written by our students. Uh, they are uh, printed exactly as received, and it's always such a joy to kind of see what folks have been up to over the era. I know we get some repeat contributions, so in some cases we can even see our uh, students as they progress over the years by their contributions. So as you're browsing through that, I am going to invite some of our students up here who have uh, written pieces for this. So we're going to start. Ah, here we are. These are all these students who helped uh, put this publication together, who contributed uh, essays and pieces for it. And we are going to start by asking Ms. Celine up to read her piece. A touristic place from Turkey. Uh, when you think of Turkey, Pamukkale is one of the first places that come to mind. Pamukkale means cotton in Turkish and Kale means castle. So this is our cotton castle and you will understand why when you see the photos or watch the videos. Actually Pamukkale is one of the most photographed sites on Instagram. Pamukkale along with Hierapolis archaeological sites and Cleopatra's antique pool is on the list of UNESCO World Heritage Sites since 1988. Pamukkale offers an unforgettable experience with the natural beauty of snow white limestone. However, that's not only attraction in Pamukkale. Hierapolis, with its ancient theater and archaeology museum, is heaven for history lovers. One of the biggest attractions in Pamukkale is the 17 calcium rich hot springs with temperatures ranging from 95 to 212 degrees. Um, would you like to fly over this natural and historical building or would you prefer to enjoy the weeks from above and loss of local life? Pamukkale also offers hot air balloon rides. Speaking of Pamukkale, you must visit Cleopatra's antique pool. This pool has been gifted to famous Egyptian queen Cleopatra by the Roman general Marcus Antinius, and it's believed that Cleopatra swam in this pool. Would you not like to say that you swam in the pool that Cleopatra swam once? To do all of this, you all need is just $5 to enter Pamukkale. My suggestion would be going there during spring or fall. In summer months, Pamukkale gets very overcrowded and very hot. Before I forget, there is also a fun fact about Pamukkale. Pamukkale's sister city is in the US and it's Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> Visit Pamukkale, you will never regret it. I was born in 1981. 
almost 42 years old. According to those who know, you are born only once. But I can assure you that in 2022, I was born. And it is that immigrating to a country totally different from yours is like being born again. Everything is new. Language, culture, place, custom, in short, everything. At the beginning, you are usually like a baby just out of the womb. When you immigrate, you go through the same stage as a baby at birth, amazement, journey, and adaptation. In the stage of amazement, I used to be dazzled by the large building, the immense shops, and the overweight traffic. A few days later, I felt longing for my poor and distant land, but at the same time, loving and proud. Finally, adaptation. And with, and with in the acceptance that everything new is real and part of your current life. At this stage, you feel that you cannot uh, with everything that is coming and find each challenge extremely difficult. Learning GPS, language, bus transportation, medical insurance, primary education, only an online and physical shopping is usually disrupted and first. Only you can transform barriers into challenges and take victory with each learning. The United States, a country of opportunities and growth, opened the doors to each of my purpose. The Caribbean English course for Spanish speakers was the first of them in which I learned online, exchange and practice with other students, while my daughter, with the ESOL program, and the help of the teacher feels confident and safe, despite the language difference. Then I found the Hilbert Public Library, an either place to learn informational, literary support, and opportunity to establish conversation in English with native and students through virtual, uh, virtual conversation corners and the emotional and interesting topics. This year, I also met the Spanish Council a big community where parents learn every day of education in the United States and exchange these uh, daily experiences. One of the most beautiful experiences I have was uh, at the Church of Scientology of Tampa. I don't think I was there by chance. I was invited after a free online finance course and really met Marta Leonardo at the beautiful mission of Scientology. Show me that beautiful and spiritual slide of life. 2023 has been a sensational year in which I have been reborn in the midst of the American dream. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are now going to get to some of our uh, awards recognizing uh, students and teachers who have uh, made some remarkable accom accomplishments this year who are nominated for awards. And we're going to start out with the Student of the Year category. I'm going to ask Paul and Jennifer to come on up and help me hand out awards for that category. We generally have over 150 students in our tutoring programs. And these students, they work hard, they study hard, uh, and hopefully uh, they, they also play hard uh, with that language learning. Uh, just to really build those skills to become a part of the community in a way that is just not possible without these skills at that same level. Um, so we are so, so happy to have them here and recognize that hard work. All of these students were nominated by their tutors, and in some cases, more than one tutor. But we are going to start off with our first student of the year. Um, and I'm not sure if everyone uh, was able to attend today, but we are going to start off with a Jacques Martier for the first uh, student of the year award. Do we have Jacques Is Lucy 
Sheila here. So she is here. She's on here by a face. I am a pure joy. Everybody come on up. So we accept that award for her. Everybody say hi. Argentina. Oh, wow. In 2023, we are not going to let a few thousand miles stop us for celebrating. Right? Come on. Beautiful. And our uh, third student of the year is Tony Phillips. of the year. Uh, we have many, many more who are also putting all the hard work. Uh, if we could have you all up here one by one, we absolutely would. But these are the three that we are recognizing today. All right, I'm going to ask Brandy and Bill to help out with the uh, graduates. We have some graduates this year who have completed all of the books for their program. And we are starting off with Ms. Mariana Sandalala. Is she here today? Yes. Perfect. Oh! <laughs> of her life to these programs. She was a champion for adult learners in particular. 
And in addition to being a literacy tutor in the community, she was an area representative, an area communicator, a coordinator, and a board member. And although she passed away in 2009, her legacy clearly goes on with this award. So uh, the Sylvia Miller Award for this year is um, Joy. Joy <laughs> So many people jumped up and said, with it unprompted, oh, it's going to be Joy, of course, right? <laughs> it, was, it was absolutely a universal thing that the moment we, we spoke about the award, your name came up immediately. When I tell you the feedback that we get from, from your emails, when you give us your updates on your students and their successes and the amazing things that they're doing in their lives, thanks to these groups that, that you're giving your time to, it was, a, it was an easy decision. So Joy, thank you so much for all that you do for our community and uh, especially your Conversation Corner group. Just a quick round of countries represented in our community and it is so fun and such a privilege to learn about so many cultures and it's so inspiring to see people working so hard to find their place here that it's really easy to just go all in with these people. It is. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have conversation corner groups throughout the county, um, and we're just going to take a moment to uh, call out the names for our leaders. We, we won't make you come up, we'll, we'll call out your names, but if you'd like to stand at your table uh, as we call your name, please do so, so that we can recognize you. So we're going to start with, with Carol. Uh, make, make her stand up. Uh, we have Christine Dunham, Dags, Jane Daniel. one thing to drill the vocabulary, it's one thing to work through the workbooks, it's one thing to learn the rules of language and to know it in that sense that you've learned the words, you've learned the order, you've learned the grammar, but to actually get a chance to use them in that low pressure, fun, easy environment is absolutely priceless and I, if you are a, 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 an ESOL student and maybe you're doing the one-on-one -on -one tutoring, I, I can't encourage you enough to also check out those conversation tutors because it is a beautiful way that our community is coming together to support each other on, in all aspects of language learning. So thank you all to our conversation corner uh, group leaders. We are going to wrap up here pretty soon. We have a, uh, a few notes to wrap up on. Uh, of course, Thanking all of our students and tutors who came here today. Um, if I could give you each an individual round of applause, I would, but I don't think, uh, I think we'd rather have snacks and get to the uh, fun stuff at the end of the program. Um, but again, we could not do this without you. And I mean that for the tutors and the students. You're doing such a valuable work in the community across the board, and I am in all the work that you put in every day. So thank you all for coming and celebrating these successes with us. I'm going to turn it over here in a moment to uh, Jennifer Schneider, who's going to introduce our new tutor training modules. There has been a lot of work put in for uh, these tutor training modules to be updated and 
uh, made into a digital program. Oh, I just saw that we missed a category. We missed a category. Oh, well, I'm going to. Uh, I apologize, we missed that one. So our 100 hours volunteers, our volunteers who have put in over 100 hours. We have Jim Elhorn, Ryan Johnson, out for any, if, if you're here, go ahead and stand for that, and we will get those awards out to you. Um, but yeah, our 100, I can't believe we missed that one. So yeah, our 100 hours, that's a lot of hours, uh, and that is, that is amazing work. As you see, our volunteers that have been recognized for other categories are, <laughs> without surprise, also in this 100 hour group, so good job, everyone. We are going to be swapping over the display here for that uh, new tutor training module and logo. There has been a lot of work put in over the past year to record uh, how the teachers, uh, how the tutors do their thing within the session and really make it a robust program to bring it into the modern age, bring it into 2023. In the era of being able to do everything over Zoom and over uh, various online things, we're so happy to be able to bring this to tutors in a digital way, in a way that makes sense for 2023. So we kind of thought about it. One of the problems that we have with tutors is that people will come and they won't realize how much time they have to dedicate. Because learning language or, or enhancing literacy skills is not something that happens overnight. So we really want to kind of say, like it's a journey that happens over time. Kind of emphasize that with the materials. The content moves from getting started as a tutor to uh, getting to know your students how to teach adult learners, because it's not like teaching children. You have to think about what adults bring, all the things that they bring, the resources. We wanted to share the instructional materials, because it's not just what we give you, but also the things you can do within the library to help support students. Um, how to track progress and share different tools for doing that. And then how to join the Hillsborough Literacy Council community through Facebook or the meet and greets now, now that COVID's over. <laughs> and the other things that we could do to help connect and network um, tutors with each other. And so this is the opening module for the tutor training and there's a table of contents that shows the progression and then the, you can't go through the whole thing, you have to go lesson by lesson, it won't open until the next one's ready. And we have the materials that I work with a team at USF who puts together online courses, so they created some new materials for Hillsborough Literacy Council. We created scenarios, like 
What if your student doesn't want to do the things that you're planning or can't, you know, like trying to solve through different scenarios. We embedded research and best practices with helpful tips and tricks, like little student hacks. And um, there's interactive features to the website, that the modules, so when you're going through, you can answer questions and it'll give you feedback along the way, so you can get instant feedback on if you're understanding the materials and and the strategies. These are. This is another example of an interactive feature. After going through the module, and you can sort your answers. And then here's another interactive feature. So we embedded lots of video to show people how to do it. And uh, for me, I think when I first started teaching, it's hard to conceptualize how to do some of the things that you're asked to do. And so seeing people do it was really important to this. So getting videos of people working through the library and actually tutoring was really helpful and important for this project. And there's a review of the instructional materials. And um, I'm working with the tutors that supported, uh, supported this project. So Jim and Ryan, shout out to both of you. Thinking about all the materials and what you can do. And I wanted to share and preview those. because. In, in edu I'm in education for K-12, we know a lot about leveled texts. If you come to adult literacy, you might not understand how texts are leveled and how materials change and what works for one person and another person. So we kind of want to give you a preview of that. And here's an example that, in the, not only that, but in the library. And unfortunately, I'm really apologizing, but I am in some of these videos with, under protest. <laughs> because I went in jeans and a t-shirt that day and they made me like talk about some things so I just want to just say that and then here's an example of um, Brian's tutoring session with uh, Jennifer and Yoha and you can see this is an online version so you can see what does it look like to tutor online and then we also have another example of tutoring in real time so you can see what that looks like too these are much longer videos I'm just showing you little clips today and then this is Harry's um, visions essay. It was one of the big uh, things that we like to do in the visions is get people's essays. And so now we have someone reading their essay and then also sharing the process of how to help someone think through writing their essay and then submitting it every year. So that way you have some materials and resources to help you as a tutor. And those of you who are already expert tutors, you can go back through these as well. And we can add on, um, we have a Padlet at the end of the module where we can add in any materials or videos or links to helpful things. So you can share them with us and we can add this on to make a growing resource for tutors. And so that, that's my, if this has assessments, it has pacing guides, and it has networks for, for everyone. And so at the end, you'll get a, uh, a certificate. I put, Jim, thank you for letting me put your name in there. I want to thank the students and the tutors who worked with me to um, create these videos and the resources. It's just really a phenomenal amount of effort and I just want to thank you all. Jennifer, thank you so much for the, she has put in so much work, folks, to get this uh, project realized. Uh, so round of applause for Jennifer. Round of applause for Jennifer. Round of applause for Jennifer. I'm nervous. I'm nervous. Yeah, and coordinating that was, was no small feat. Uh, if you know the term gathering bugs in a basket, Herding kittens, uh, getting all of us together and tracking to make that a reality is was impressive. So thank you so much for that. Uh, this is the the uh, brand new uh, Literacy Council logo that was rolled out during one of the meetings recently. I'll have Brandy come up for her closing remarks. So I don't know if you wanted to speak on the logo, but we're very excited. I think it's a, it's a beautiful new logo. You guys, today has been a wonderful day. First, I want to say thank you again to Jennifer for all her hard work. She really put in countless hours to kind of bring us into the modern age. And I do think you can see how valuable this will be to getting tutors to students more immediately. 
So thank you, Jennifer, again for all your hard work on that. I wanted to say thank you to the rest of the board as well. Jennifer is our vice president. We have Drew Pfeiffer who can't be here with us today, but he's our treasurer. Bill Hunter, if you could stand. He's our secretary. <laughs> Set that right away. <laughs> Thank you.